All right, I'm just going to con just continue on the topic of church authority. So we learned last week a bit about uh, the office of a bishop. We learned about the office of a deacon. Uh, we talked about why God has authority in the local church for, for various reasons. You can go back and listen to that sermon. Um, and, you know, the fact that um, men are ordained to be leaders in the church and not women. And it's not because women are of any less value. It's just because that's how God has ordained it. And uh, women have a tendency to be more easily deceived. So God put men in charge, not only because God are accountable to men, but also because men have a tendency to be uh, more solid on the truth and on what they believe. And that's just not how God has, has, has ordained it. Um, you know, the world is trying to change that. You know, the world is trying to put women in charge and trying to put women in charge in the church. But that's not how God would have it. And as Bible-believing Christians, we need to hold to the truth because if we don't, uh, you know, one danger is, is if we start to compromise on what the Bible clearly says, then it's hard to take a stand on anything the Bible says, right? Because when the Bible starts to say other things, you know, people say, well, you're a bit inconsistent because the Bible clearly says here that, you know, the bishop and the deacon should be men and should be the husband of one wife. And if you're not going to take that literally, why should we take anything literally? Why should we take the resurrection literally? Why should we take uh, what Jesus taught about salvation literally? So it, it is very important that when things are clearly stated in the Bible that we need to accept it as Bible-believing Christians. Otherwise, we destroy our own foundation from underneath our feet. Um, but let's, let's continue on that topic of church authority. Um, what I would just want to talk about first of all is how, how church authority, so the bishop and the deacon, how are they ordained? Because we have different methods going around in different churches, but I believe the Bible gives us a clear method on how uh, bishops and deacons are ordained or appointed. And we'll just look here first at Titus 1 verse 5. It says here, well, let's read from verse 4. So this is a letter from Paul, the, the apostle to Titus. It says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Saviour. For this cause left I, so just, just note that, that singular there, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So just note the I, the thee, the thou, the thee, these are singular terms. <coughs> For this cause, I'll just read that again, left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So I believe that the way bishops and deacons should be appointed or ordained um, is like a, 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 how do I say this? It's, it's by the authority of one bishop in order to ordain the next bishop or to put uh, deacons into, into position. Because we see here in verse 5 that when Paul ordained Titus, the, the authority didn't come from a group of people. He just says, for this, this cause left I thee in Crete. And then he says later on, as I had appointed thee. So it wasn't as we had appointed thee, as what happens in some churches. You have like a board of elders or a board of bishops or a board of pastors that you know, have to decide collectively who's going to uh, be appointed as a bishop or a deacon. Paul says, as I had appointed thee, but then he also says to Titus, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. So he didn't say get together with all the other bishops in Crete and then decide who's going to be appointed as bishops. He left that charge alone to Titus. Um, let's go to 2 Timothy. I'll just show you this passage here. This is what Paul writes to Timothy and he says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we see here to Timothy that Timothy was given the charge, him singular, the same commit thou, Timothy, to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we see here that ordination comes uh, from top down and it comes from a, the, the authority of a single bishop to ordain the next, next bishop. Now, what does that mean? That means that bishops shouldn't be self-appointed, right? You shouldn't just say, hey, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to start a church and I'm just going to be um, the, the bishop of that church. I mean, it doesn't work that way um, because God has set in place that bishops lay hands on the next person and, and um, 
ordain the bishop. That's what I believe anyway. So I'm not saying that, you know, therefore if somebody goes out and starts a church that that's not a legitimate church because we've already covered that a church can be legitimate if it doesn't have any elders, if it doesn't have any bishop because it's just a group of people that have come together to worship Jesus Christ and for the purpose of Jesus Christ. But it's not, all, it's not ideal and I don't think it's something that we should be seeking. And generally what happens when somebody goes out that's not, all, not ordained or somebody goes out to, to gather a church, uh, they end up basically you know, being that bishop and I don't think that's ideal if they have not been ordained because they may not meet the qualifications and, and God has certain things that he's put in place as a testing ground before people are ordained um, uh, to, to look after churches and, and pastor churches. But a person might ask, well, what if there is no one willing to ordain me? You know, because let's say you're in an area where, you know, everyone is preaching a false gospel, nobody's using the King James Bible anymore, and you say nobody's willing to ordain me uh, for the positions that I take a stand on. Well, a couple of things we can discuss there is, you know, well, number one, if there's nobody willing to ordain you, it just maybe it's just not the right timing yet. You know, I mean, we don't have to rush God's will. We don't have to force our hand. Uh, you know, does it, does it, just because you're not ordained and you're not a, not a bishop of a church, does it, not, does it mean you can't do anything for Jesus? I mean, you can still go soul winning. You can still, you know, do what you need to do as a Christian and, 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 and learn the Bible and do all those things. It just doesn't, it just means that you don't have authority yet in a local church and maybe you just need to submit to the authorities that are there, even if they're not perfect. But with that being said, you know, I don't believe that that will ever be the case. I, 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 I you know, if Jesus says, you know, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you really think Jesus would let any country or any, any, any nation or any, the world even, to get to the point where there is nobody faithfully preaching the gospel that would not want to train people up to, to, to ordain them and send them out to start churches and to gather his people? I just don't believe that's the case. And, you know, we know for a fact in Australia that's not the case. Why? Because this church exists. You know, because if somebody believed the things we did and they came here, you know, I'm not strict about all the different standards and all the extra biblical positions and preferences you can have. You know, I just want somebody that is, you know, going to take a stand for the Word of God and wants to go to an area and preach the gospel to every creature that is preaching the right gospel with the right Bible. So if somebody wants, if somebody, you know, meets the qualifications and has a desire to hold the office of a bishop, you know, maybe that person may just need, need to move. You know, they might need to just move their family to get to a church that does have the right positions that they can work with and one day be sent out of. Or, you know, what is more likely the case is that person may just need to grow to the point where they could submit to the authority that has been put under them. Because what's usually the case is, it's not that there isn't a church for them to go to, it's just that sometimes people will go to a church and they, they cause trouble with the positions that they have. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with having different positions. And in this church, you know, I welcome discussion. I welcome, you know, I want people to talk about the Bible. And even if it's contrary positions, because, you know, if you're not going to talk about the Bible here, where are you going to talk, talk, talk about it? Um, where are you going to talk about the Bible? And I'd rather people talk about the Bible here and bounce off people that know the Bible and have the right positions than you know, like this Anglican lady that turned Muslim that we spoke to yesterday, where she went to her rector of her Anglican church. I didn't even know that the leaders in Anglican churches were called rectors. Did you guys know that? She said she went to a rector, and I was like, what is a rector? <laughs> and she says it's like the pastor of an Anglican church. I was like, okay, I thought they were called pastors as well. So she went to a rector, and then she said she went to, you know, the, 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 this born-again church. So I'm guessing she went to a Pentecostal church or something like that, and she was asking questions about the Trinity and all that sort of stuff. You know, she didn't get the answers, so uh, it's, it's just a, it's a shame. And I wouldn't want somebody who came to our church that had questions, go to a rector or go to, you know, a born-again church, rather than just coming here to people that actually uh, believe the Bible and are saved and, and can give them the right answers. But, you know, there's a difference between, you know, discussing the Bible and, and causing trouble. And, and I think we all know the difference. I mean, there's a gray line between where it starts and stops because, you know, you can't often control the other person's response. But, you know, we, can, we can't control how another person will respond, but we can control how we respond. We know whether we're getting proud. We know whether we're getting angry. We know whether, you know, we're trying to, you know, uh, sly around and, and, and cause division. So obviously we should not be doing that as much as possible. 
you know, division and, and contention in the church is, is going to be inevitable. Um, and and it's, it's not a, necessarily a bad thing. You know, contention is not necessarily bad in and of itself. I think it's how we respond to it. Because if we, as a church, know, hey, you know what? People are going to have differing opinions. I shouldn't get offended when somebody brings something to me. Then we can keep that unity. We can keep that discussion open. And we can keep talking. We don't have to get upset at one another. And we can sharpen each other, as the Bible says. So they're appointed top down and, and the authority comes from an, an existing bishop. So it's not self-appointed, but also it's not appointed bottom up. So this whole idea of churches voting to put bishops in power is totally against the Bible. Because even if somebody said, well, you needed to have multiple elders or multiple bishops in order to ordain the next bishop, that's still coming from top down. That's not the, the sheep choosing the shepherd. And I just want to talk about a couple of reasons why I believe voting is a very foolish method of uh, choosing who is going to be an authority. You know, number one, when you vote in authority, the authority is no longer the authority. Because if you vote, then the majority is the authority. You know what I mean? This is why, uh, you know, we have democratic societies because they don't want the politicians ruling, even though that's what they end up doing. Um, they're meant to be representing the population. So, you know, in Australia we have a, a democracy. So, you know, the authority is with the majority because that's what's meant to be, uh, you know, running the country and the, and the politicians are meant to be representing us. But, you know, this is the problem with democracy because the problem with democracy is its rule of the 51%. So the 49% just get ruled uh, by the 51%. And this is why it, democracy, you know, we, in Australia we talk about how great democracy is and, oh, you know, we have a, a, this great government and this great democracy in Australia. But what happens when you're in the 49%? Right? You know, now as Christians, we're in the 49%. And now what's happening? You have, you know, gay marriage. You have uh, all the things that are happening in, in Australia. And there's nothing we can do to stop it, even though we hold the right positions and the moral positions, but morality is just going to change with society because that's the problem with democracy. It's rule of the 51% over the 49%. And you know, those in the 51%, they love democracy. You know, people that are in the 51%, they love democracy. It's only once they're in the 49% that they realize democracy is not the perfect system that it should be. And you know, this is why as God's people, we should not, you know, we should not, you know, promote and before ideologies that are contrary to the Bible. Because, you know, you don't see democracy in the Bible. You don't see, de God didn't set up democracy in the Old Testament. He gave the law and then he gave judges and he appointed judges to judge using that perfect law of God. You know, not, not man-made law and definitely not law that is decided by 51% of the people. You know, when I went to America, they, they would always say, because they're a... Uh, what is it, a re uh, republic or something like that? I can't remember what they're called, their, their way of politics. You know, but they would always you know, say, because I was from Australia, they'd say, oh, you know, democracy doesn't work. They would describe democracy as you know, two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. Um, that's what they would say about democracy. And one of, my friends, one of my friends in Phoenix, his name was Chris, he would always say, you know what democracy is? Democ gang rape, he'd say, is democracy in action. That's how, that's how bad that they thought about democracy. So democracy is, is, uh, is not a perfect system. And you know, why, why would it be logical that the sheep would choose their own shepherd? I mean, if the shepherd is there to look after the sheep, then obviously the sheep are not in a position to choose who their shepherd is. Um, there would be a bit of a bias there. Let's turn to, to Matthew 7, verse 13. Because why biblically is it um, not wise to go with a majority vote? Uh, look at what it says here in Matthew 7. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So this verse is obviously talking about salvation, saying, hey, you know, many will try to will enter in through the wide gate and it'll go through just to destruction but few are going to find that straight and narrow gate which is the lord jesus christ and you know that was one thing i found in my own life you know i, I used to go to a presbyterian church 
And I already thought the way was narrow at the, that Presbyterian church because I was thinking, you know what, you know, we, it's a, it was a pretty fundamental church. They, they took a stand for the King James Bible and even on that issue alone, that's already, a, a, you know, a, a narrow path in a sense. But then when I learned what salvation was, that it was only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that it wasn't turn from your sins, it wasn't keep the commandments, it wasn't what a lot of people say, you know, give your life to Jesus, commit your life to Jesus. It was simply trusting Jesus Christ, receiving him as your savior, you know, not as your Lord, because that's works as well. But I realized how narrow that way actually is. And even amongst churches that are like ours in Sydney and Australia, you, I don't for you guys that have the right positions, you're starting to realize how narrow that gate really is. So in terms of salvation, you know, the majority are generally wrong. So when it comes to the word, why would we assume then that the majority would be right? So it would be foolish um, to go with the majority when the majority are usually wrong. And you know, it's the same with a, with a board of elders, you know, even a board of deacons or you know, any board, any, anything that requires uh, a group of people to come to a consensus because the majority is normally wrong it's hard to come to that consensus and and generally it'll go astray because it's more likely that somebody in that group will be off and will will stop that progress from going forward that's why god gives that authority and that charge to the individual um, because there, there will always be one man willing to take a stand <clears throat> And you know, appealing to authority is always a bad argument as well. And we should, we should never do that. And sometimes we do that just unwillingly, right? Because sometimes we'll be talking to somebody and we'll make statements like, oh, nobody believes that. But that's a bad argument because it doesn't matter if nobody believes it because if it's in the word of God, who cares how many people believe it? And you know, often people would tell me that. I remember arguing with somebody, you know, in a independent church for my stand on the King James Bible. And I was saying, you know, I believe the King James Bible is perfect. I believe that it's the perfect word of God and it's a perfect translation. And they said to me, yeah, well, but no, no pastor, no bishop believes that. And I just said, well, I don't care if nobody believes it. Like if nobody believes it, that doesn't make it wrong. And I'm going to believe it even if nobody believes it because I'm going to take a stand for what I believe is right. Um, I'm not going to go with the majority. And, and you know, arguing from the majority, it, it, you know, is always wrong. Um, you know, even yesterday, you know, the Muslim lady that I spoke to would say, oh, you look, look how many millions of people are converting to Islam. And, uh, you know, I would question that because a lot of people think that Islam is just growing so fast because they're having children. Because unfortunately, you know, the Christian world is not having children. They're having one or two kids and the population is slowly dying. Whereas, you know, when you see Muslims in the shopping center, they're having three, four, five. Well, of course, after a couple of generations, they're going to take over that suburb because, you know, eventually the people that believe the truth are going to die off and, and what's left are the people that don't. So that's why we don't go with the majority. And a couple of other things. You know, if you can be voted in, you can be voted out. You know, if you can be voted in into authority, they, they can just vote you out. And also, you know, if the majority is the authority, there's a temptation to be a people pleaser, right? Because if the majority are going to vote you in, if you lose that authority, that's why politicians, they're always playing the people because they need that popular vote. Whereas if authority comes top down from godly people that don't care what the people think, then there will be, I guess, a righteous spiritual lineage in a sense of people ordaining and putting people in authority that meet those qualifications. You know, when I was in the Presbyterian church, it was really funny around election time because every three years they would have an election to decide who was going to be the next bishops and elders and deacons. So every three years there was the campaign trail, right? There was the, you know, the, the families would go and then they'd have dinner with you and they'd be on their best behavior because in a couple of weeks you're going to cast your vote in that meeting to decide who um, is going to be um, the next, you know, pastor, assistant pastor, elder and deacon. But you know what was really funny? I just want to share this story with you because in that church, in order to be a deacon, you just needed majority votes. So you just needed 50% of the people to say yes to your name. Then you would be appointed as a deacon. But to be appointed as an elder or an, an assistant pastor or a pastor, you had to get two thirds majority vote, right? And the funny thing that happened there is because the church was divided on who should be the pastor and who shouldn't be the pastor, there was a bit of a split going on at the time, that none of the pastors, the, the previous pastors, and none of the assistant pastors, and none of the elders got re-elected. 
Because even though they had majority, they had like 50 something percent of the votes, they didn't have two thirds of the vote and only one deacon got voted in. Now, what a foolish scenario a church can get themselves in is if you have voting and you have two thirds majority vote where you had a bishop looking after the church, you had an assistant bishop, you had, a, uh, had deacons looking after the church, and then after your election you have no pastors, no bishops, you have one deacon looking after the church. I just thought that was funny. So that's why we don't do votes here, because you know, not only is it a foolish way of making decisions, but because you know, the majority is not accountable. I've already sort of covered this, but you, know, you are not accountable to how this church is run. I'm going to be accountable. This is why the boss at works. The boss at work makes decisions and has authority at work because he is accountable to his boss for the budget or for the numbers or whatever. It's the same in this church because I'm accountable to God of how this church here is run. Why would I then pass that authority over to somebody else? And that's another reason why the man is the head of the house is because the man is accountable to God for his family. So God gives the man authority to run that house because he ultimately is accountable for his house. So what if leadership becomes corrupt? You say, oh, you know, but if you only have one person in charge, what if that person goes corrupt and what if they, they go astray? Well, you know, I already touched on the fact that, you know, they're accountable. So they're going to answer to God if they, you know, misuse the funds, you know, uh, abuse their position of power, abuse their influence. But still, even if leadership becomes corrupt in a single top-down sort of method, I would still rather go with one man of God that met the qualifications than to go with the majority. So I'd still take my chances with that one man rather than the majority. But, you know, if, if leadership goes corrupt, then, you know, there's always the option to leave the church. You know, obviously, if you don't agree with how we do things here and you don't agree with, with how we run things, you know, there are plenty of other, you know, we're not the only church that believes the right things. There are, there are other churches that uh, you could go to, and that's one way you could, you know, voice um, your difference of opinion. But, you know, obviously I think it's better if, uh, you know, we talked about it first, if there was something that you disagree with, and that's one reason why I try and keep the line of communication open. And I welcome you to come. You know, many of you know already that you would come to me and you'll ask questions and things like that. And, you know, I'm not perfect, so I'm not going to say that I'm always going to give you the most spiritual response. You know, I'm also made of flesh. But, um, you know, I, I, I definitely, you know, try to keep myself accountable and let you guys know, like, hey, come and, and bring your issues to me. If you think anything should be different, if you think anything's wrong, uh, come and talk to me. Because I think it would be really sad if there was something that, you know, was bothering you. Maybe you had the wrong, you know, maybe you have the wrong understanding. And may, or maybe you don't know the reasoning behind why we do it here. And then you're just left without asking or without talking. And, and you know, maybe if uh, you had a different understanding or maybe we could have talked about it, uh, we could have resolved that before um, going to somewhere else. Because obviously, you know, I think this is the best church because that's why I'm here and it's the way I run it. So, you know, that's my, my unbiased opinion. So I think it'd be great if you stayed here and you got involved in the work that we're trying to do, which is to knock every door in this city. That's what that map on the wall is. Okay, let's uh, just go back to Titus 1. We'll just read a couple of verses here. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now there's a similar list in 1 Timothy 3, but I just want to just go through a couple of these real quick. But um, a couple of things I just want to mention, you, you know, we can see here that the bishop has to be a man, right? Because the Bible says he's the husband of one wife. If you're a lady, you can't be the husband of one wife. And by default, that's why, you know, you couldn't meet these qualifications. But also it says, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So I believe, my, my opinion is, is that if you want to be a bishop or a deacon, you must have children. Um, you know, sometimes nowadays people are getting, you know, sent out of Bible colleges, 
you know, as single men being ordained as bishops and deacons. This is wrong, first of all, because they're not the husband of one wife. But second of all, they don't have any children. So even if somebody is married, um, I believe they need to have children because I think there is a big difference between having children and keeping your marriage together than just having a marriage without children. I think, you know, family is a very big point on meeting the qualifications of a bishop and a deacon. So then it says, a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. Why? Because you're going to be contending with people, right? So you want to be somebody that's patient and not soon angry. But not only that, because people that are saved that are wanting to grow are going to challenge you too. And if you um, are soon angry and, and, and fly off the handle too much, you're going to discourage those people. You're going to get those people out of what otherwise could be a good church that they could be a part of. So not soon angry, not given to wine. Oh, that's, that's a... That's a, that's a no-brainer. No striker. You know, I don't have a problem with this one, you know, because uh, I was never much of a fighter. And you can see my physique. I wouldn't uh, ever try <laughs> to pick a fight with somebody because I'd just get smashed. So, um, you know, no striker. Um, not given to filthy lucre. Because you're going to be in charge of funds, obviously you can't have a, a greedy spirit or somebody that's covetous because um, there'll be the temptation there to abuse those funds that, people, that you're going to be in charge of. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. I just want to point out there, it says a lover of hospitality. Now that means that, you, that doesn't mean that you love hospitality, because we all love hospitality. That means that you love to be hospitable, right? So it's a lover of hospitality because, you know, part of being a bishop and a deacon is sharing your life with other people. And, you know, sometimes bishops and deacons want to seclude their life from everyone else. You know, they want to segregate, you know, their church life with their personal life. You know, I don't think that's right because that's not what you're called to do. You're called to be an example. And part of that is people knowing what your life is about. That's why I started putting sort of personal posts on the blog and things like that. Uh, I'm not just trying to make it about me. You know, that's not the purpose. But I just want people when they see our church that they see my life and they see uh, what the leader of this church is like. Because number one, I want to be an example to people. But another reason why you want to be a hospitable person if you're a leader of a church is because generally, you know, you might start the church in your home, but I think it's also to be accountable to the people because how often, you know, can a leader of a church be one person at church but another person in their personal life and then before you know it, they're crossing a state border to go sleep with some 16-year-old and you're like, well, where did that come from? Well, it's, maybe it's because they, they weren't really sharing their life with other people because if you do share your life with other people, you know, eventually they're going to know what sort of person you are. You can't hide it. And for those of you that are part of this church that know me and have come and eat dinner with us and have come bowling with us and have spent enough time with us, I mean, eventually I can't hide the sort of person I am. I couldn't hide, you know, the type of relationship I have with my wife. I couldn't hide, um, you know, how my children behave and what sort of people they are and, and to prove to you that they are in subjection and not accused of right or unruly. Um, and last of all, you know, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, we won't turn to 1 Timothy 3 for sake of time, but you can read that in your own time. So there's a, there's a similar list, and then it goes on to the qualifications of a deacon. So the deacon has very similar qualifications in terms of, you know, their wife being in subjection and also their children so not only are your children, you know, showing you that you can qualify to be a bishop and a deacon, but also your wife, it's your family. So I won't turn there for sake of time, but I just wanted to point out just three things that I think are very important about this passage um, and, and what really I would look for if I was to ordain somebody. Um, number one is when you look at this list of qualifications, you'll notice that what is more emphasized that even in 1 Timothy 3 is the character of the person. Because often in churches like ours where, you know, we take the right positions, you know, salvation by faith, the King James Bible, eternal security, um, all the positions that we take, you know, once saved, always saved, we start to emphasize, I'm not going to say overemphasize because they are very important. They're important. But we start to emphasize them more than the character of a person when we're deciding whether or not to ordain them. And I don't think that's the emphasis that God has um, when he's looking at the qualifications of a, of a bishop and a deacon, because you'll see that, first of all, the, the character and his family is mentioned 
before holding fast the faithful word. So even though somebody can have the right positions, because often you'll come across people that have all the right positions, but they don't have the character and the family that's required, I think, to lead and to shepherd people. Because you know, a leader needs to be patient with people. And they need to, um, you know, be open. They need, like, like all the things that it says here, that there are certain characteristics you need to hold. And I believe that is emphasized more uh, than the doctrine. And one way, now point number two is one way that character is tested and that character is revealed is through his family. Because it says here, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So we see there that you're blameless. It mentions your wife and your children. And then it says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. And then it goes on to list his characteristics. So this is why I think it's so important that bishops and deacons have children. And you can see that their children are not just these brats that don't listen to them and um, you know, are just you know, running around and, and, and uh, unruly, the Bible says, because that's the testing ground to show, you know, do you have your family in order? Because in 1 Timothy 3, it says, if you know not how to rule your own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So number one, um, character is emphasized more than doctrine. Number two, your family is a test of that character and that leadership. And, and number three, it says here, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, unfortunately, we're hearing a lot more and more of bishops that are only ordaining people and only sending people out if they hold to their exact positions and their exact preferences and opinions. And I don't think that's right because you know what? You know, we're never going to be exactly the same because... You know, the Bible is, is, a, is, a, is, a, you know, is a book that has doctrines that sometimes people can take different positions on. You know, not, not key doctrines, because I think if it's key doctrines, they're pretty clear. But you can have different preferences. You know, how the church is run, how you would run around the government, how you'd run, want to run the finances. Um, you know, different positions of end times, different positions. There, there are many different things. But, um, you know, so nobody's going to be 100% the same. I think... Every bishop needs to decide what uh, standard they're going to hold to of whether or not they're going to ordain somebody. Because ultimately, like I said, that bishop is responsible and accountable to the person, people that he puts into the ministry. So I think just like God in the Old Testament gave human judgment, God gave them the guidelines and then gave human judgment. I think it's the same with the appointing of bishops and deacons. God gives us the guidelines and then puts human judgment in place to decide, do they meet those qualifications? So I'm not really going to condemn another bishop if he puts somebody in power that doesn't have children. Because I know that some people, trans, you know, some people interpret this to say, well, if he has children, they need to be not accused of right or unruly. Not necessarily that he has to have children. So you know what, I'm, I'm not going to you know, be up in arms just because a bishop doesn't have children because he's been ordained by somebody that doesn't believe he must have children. Uh, I personally wouldn't because I believe it's important to, to, to pass that test. But what I, would, what I would like to see is just that the positions that a person holds, like the Bible says, he's holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. So number one, we see that, that he's humble enough to, to learn and to be open to, to be corrected. But the fact that he's holding fast the faithful word, because a lot of people, unfortunately, are not holding fast their positions because of the faithful word. They're holding fast their positions because of tradition, because of culture. And um, it's sad when you ask a bishop a question and they say, well, I don't really know why I have this position. This is just the position I've always had. And you're just like, all right, well, you know, it'd be good if you maybe studied that out and held fast to the faithful word and had a position that was based on the Bible, not because that was what you were taught or that's what you've always believed from what you learned in Bible college or whatever. All right, what about the question of should a church have multiple elders as opposed to just one? Um, now, I'm not against multiple elders. And I think throughout the Bible, we see the churches did have multiple elders. And if, our, if churches had multiple elders, I, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I just want to show you this verse in Numbers. Uh, 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. 
And the Lord came down in the cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them and they were of them that were written. And, and they were of them that were written, but, not, but went not out unto the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. So this was the appointment of the 70 elders that Moses did and he laid their hands on them and they were filled with the Spirit. And, there, and look at this. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Edad and Mel, Ed, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them. Now, I don't know if I'm applying this verse totally correctly, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But when I was thinking of multiple elders, I thought about this verse where, you know, additional elders were there to help Moses with his, with his duties and with the leadership of the, the congregation of Israel. And we see here that, you know, Joshua, the son of Nun, sort of in his zeal for Moses' authority, says, you know, look, Moses, like, forbid these people from, from teaching in the camp. And then Moses makes this statement and says, you know, envious thou for my sake? You know, are you, are you trying to, you know, basically, are, are you worried about what it's going to do to me? He says, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And, you know, I have that same feeling when I think about multiple elders is, yeah, hey, that would be great. You know, would, would, you know, would the Lord that all the qualified men could, could, could be ordained and start churches and, and, and have that position? But you know what? I don't think that's the problem. You know, maybe in some circles the problem is, you know, there are qualified men and nobody wants to ordain them. But, you know, in my eyes, I think, hey, it would be great if there were more men that met those qualifications because the more elders, the better, right? So the question is not, you know, why not have multiple elders? Why do we only have one elder in this church? Well, it's because right now we only just have one. Um, I'm not against having multiple. I think it would be great if there are multiple. Um, but the question is more, are there even multiple men qualified to have multiple elders? Because it's great to say, hey, we want elders, we want more elders. Well, where are the men? You know, we need the men to meet the qualifications so that we can have those multiple elders. And let's say our church had multiple elders. You know, we're so small and, you know, is it, is it even a need? But, you know, let's say we had two elders in this church. Why would we keep those elders together when, you know, Australia is such a dry and thirsty land for good Bible-believing churches? I mean, we'd probably spread out, right? That's why one day we're going to uh, ordain Kevin. Kevin's working towards that goal. And we're planning on going out, sending him out to the Sunshine Coast to start a church there. Because what's the point of ordaining him and keeping him here when we already have an elder here, when there are people that uh, you know, don't have a church like this to go to. So if you had multiple, why not uh, spread them out? But number two, can you even support multiple elders? Because you know, what, what's the point of having multiple elders if you can't even pay these elders? Because you know, right now, you know, I'm working a full-time job as well because you know, our church isn't at the point where it could support me financially. So you know, do you even have the funds as, as a church to have multiple elders. So, you know, what's the point of having two, three, four, five elders um, when, when you can't even support them? They might say, well, you need to have multiple elders to, so that they're accountable to one another. But we already saw, you know, and I won't turn there since last week, but, you know, bishops and deacons, or well, bishops specifically, are accountable to God. They're not accountable to each other. Right? So one is not accountable to the other. So when you say, well, they're there for accountability, or okay, maybe finances, if you have that sort of structure where you've you know, got to vote on finances and all that stuff, and you don't want one person taking the finances from everyone else. But in terms of doctrinal independence, I mean, they're not accountable to one another because if one elder starts preaching a false gospel or whatever, I mean, he's accountable to God and the others can just separate. Because if they didn't agree to one, with one another, that they would just separate and start separate churches. So this whole idea of accountability um, doesn't really make sense. And one bishop should not have authority over another. We don't see that structure in the Bible. So I don't believe that there should be like a lead pastor or a head pastor and then the assistant pastors under him um, where you have this difference of hierarchy because once you are ordained a bishop you are on equal footing with every other bishop you don't see this hierarchy in the bible 
But you know what? There doesn't really need to be a hard and fast rule because you know, what, you know, man's ma man's nature is to set these hard and fast rules where God hasn't. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter whether a church has one and you say, well, you can't have one; you need to have multiple, or you know, somebody saying, oh, you should have one and you should have this structure or this hierarchy. Uh, you know what, you know, we, I don't think we really need to make a hard and fast rule where God hasn't made a hard and fast rule. We can allow, you know, liberty among God's people. We can have liberty where people can exercise their preferences and opinions uh, and not go outside the clear teachings of the scripture. You know, I, one saying I always liked was when they say, you know, you can be outside of the box, but make sure you're inside the book. Um, and, you know, I'm more concerned when it comes to how other churches structure. You know what? I'm not so concerned about how they structure their authority or how they structure their leadership. You know what I'm more concerned about? I'm more concerned about whether they're preaching the truth. You know, like, I'm more concerned that they're preaching salvation by faith, that you can't lose your salvation, that it's not repent of your sins. I'm more concerned that they're taking a stand for the King James Bible and revealing to people the fallacies of these false Bibles that are being uh, palmed off to people these days. So that's what I'm more worried about. I'm not so much worried about how they structure their authority. So they, they have a structure, they do votes. You know, I'm, I'm not for that. That's not my preference. And I don't think that's what the scripture, ex, scriptural example is. But that's not my main concern when I'm uh, looking at other churches. I'm more concerned that they're preaching heresy than um, how they're being structured. All right, the last thing I just want to cover is on this topic of authority. Now let's just turn to Ephesians 5. The last thing I just want to cover is the fact that we are uh, an independent church and why we are an independent church and what it means to be independent. Um, because you'll notice on our website, you know, it says we're a KJV only, soul winning, independent church. So what, what does it mean by independent and why, uh, why do we choose to be independent, make it a point to be independent? Well, in Ephesians 5, the Bible says here in verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And I'll just read the next verse so you ladies don't think I'm just stopping there for making a point. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So we see there the two roles, the husband and wife, and um, their respective responsibilities. But we see there that the picture of the husband and the wife is the picture of Christ to the church. So Christ is the head of every church, just like Christ is the head of every family. So the, the husband answers to Christ, just like the pastor or the bishop will answer to Jesus Christ. And Christ inevitably is the head of this body. So the reason why we're an independent church is because we need to keep Christ as the head of this body and not another church the head of this body. Because if we were part of a denomination, now Christ is no longer the head of this church. If we were part of a denomination, it might be a board somewhere, it might be a, you know, a mission council somewhere, or it might be another church that is still deciding what happens in this church, and that should not be the case. Uh, we see as well also in Colossians 1, We'll just read from verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, uh, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So every church should answer to Jesus Christ. And this is why we need to be independent, because we shouldn't be answering to another church. This church and its authority should be answering directly to Jesus Christ. You know, and submitting to the authority that is in a church, it's part of obeying Christ. Because some people will say, you know, well, you know, it's like we want, to, we want Christ to be the head of our church and that's why we don't want a man to be in charge. But then 
you know, part of Christ's plan and part of God's plan is that there is authority in the church. So part of Christ being the head of this church is that there is an authority in place and, and we have a responsibility as Christians to be in subject to that authority. Or within the bounds of this church, obviously, not in your personal life. Um, but see, so independent, it doesn't mean that you don't have any authority. It doesn't mean an independent church is just all, anything goes and everyone's equal here in authority. Independent just means that we, are, we govern ourselves. It means that we're not governed by people that are outside of this assembly here. And, you know, we talked about what a church was as opposed to the body of Christ. And, you know, I, I think this is the main reason why people really adamantly oppose the teaching of a universal church. Because think about it. If there is authority set in the church, you know, and the church can be rightly called the body, but it's the congregation of people that has the authority. Well, if there is a universal church, therefore the authority in the church should have authority over everybody, right? Because if we're all part of this one church, then they have authority. No, because they don't have authority in the body of Christ. I have authority in this church, which is this gathering of believers here. And that's why this, this idea of a universal church can, can lead you astray, because if we're all part of one church, then does that mean authority in the church has authority over different churches and that's why you know a lot of protestant churches and catholic churches they they have this doctrine of the universal church and that's why they can justify controlling multiple churches and and having a denomination which i don't believe is right all right first corinthians 12 for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is christ for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, wh wh whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, I am not of the hand, I am, I, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, but much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. I personally think that's talking about things like maybe your heart and things like that that look really weird, but um, they're very important. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then it goes on to talk about the authority which we covered last week. So, you know, we read here that, you know, we as the believers are like the body, are, are the body of Jesus Christ and we should be treated like such. So, you know, the body parts, because the church is like a section of that body, isn't it? Because when the body gathers together, it makes a church. So... Every part of the body answers to the head, doesn't it? The head decides what the body does. But you see, another body part shouldn't be telling another body part what to do. So this is why churches should be independent, because my hand shouldn't be in authority over the foot, right? The head is the authority, and the head is deciding what the hand and foot does. So that's why, you know, every church should answer to the head, which is Jesus Christ. And it means that if one church goes bad, it doesn't pull every church down with it. Because when churches are all yoked together and they all have a common interest um, and common financial interest as well, sometimes when one part goes down, it drags every church down with it. So that's one reason why you'd want to be independent. But just because we're independent, it doesn't mean churches can't work together. I mean, often we think of this passage as members within a church body. But we can think of it as different churches as well. Like, you know, just because we differ with other churches, it doesn't mean we can't work together on certain things. We all play a part in the big picture. 
But we also see here in this passage that you know all parts are necessary. Just because a part may be more uncomely than another, it doesn't mean that it's not needful. Uh, all parts are necessary, and all parts of the body play their part. And I, I, and us, you, you know, you as church members of this body, you know, you want to take that upon yourself because you need to realize that you play a part in this body. And when you know when you're missing from this body, you know something is missing. So we need to take ownership there and realize that you know, we do affect the body of Christ. You know, when something is missing, uh, the body doesn't function properly. When there are issues between members, it hurts the whole body. So no man is an island or no woman is an island in the body of Christ. You know, what you do affects other people and your example will affect other people. You know what, if you're not soul winning, you know, you're going to discourage others from soul winning. And the more people we don't have soul winning, the more comfortable other people are going to get not going soul winning. So, you know, we want to keep this church soul winning. We want to keep this church, you know, on the right path. We want to keep worldliness out of this church. So, you know, if you come to church and you're just talking about, you know, worldly stuff and, you know, you have worldly interests and things like that, you know, that's going to affect other people. But on the same token, if you're on fire for God, if you're on fire for the truth, if you're on fire for soul winning, that's going to encourage other people. So it can be a positive and a negative difference that you make. You know, Jesus talked about, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So what you want to note is that there is no neutral position. If you're walking in the flesh, you're doing harm to the body of Christ. If you're walking in the spirit, you're doing good to the body of Christ. So it's in our best interest that we all strive to walk in the spirit as much as we can. So really ask yourself that question, you know, does my life glorify God? You know, is my life, when I look at my life, is it drawing people closer to God? Is it encouraging people to do more for God? Is it encouraging people to, you know, uh, get into the Bible and to study the word of God? Or is my life pushing people away from God? Is my life distracting people from the Word of God? Is my life discouraging people from what's doing, doing the right thing? Think about that question. Now, does independence necessarily mean, um, does it necessarily mean financial independence? You know, because you can be an independent church, but still be supported by another church. It doesn't mean that you should not take support from other people, or even you should not be supported by other people. So I don't believe that just because a church is independent, that they govern themselves, that it means necessarily that it's wrong for a bishop to be supported by other churches. Because a lot of bishops, you know, before they're ordained into the ministry, they'll go around and they'll get support and people want to support them so that they don't have to work a full-time job. So does independence necessarily mean financial independence? No. Um, you know, because can a preacher be financially dependent but still doctrinally independent? Well, you know, it's possible. So we can't just say, oh, you know, they're getting a paycheck, therefore they're serving that person. Because any paid bishop or deacon is ultimately being supported by his people. Because if you say it's wrong for a bishop to be supported by other churches and then therefore he has an interest to serve those churches, well, there might, be a, there might be a temptation to do that, but it's the same if even I was supported by you guys. You know, I could technically be financially dependent on you guys, but does that mean that I'm doctrinally dependent, that I would necessarily make you guys my master? No. I think there is a temptation to do that, and that's the danger of being supported and knowing where your funds come from, that ultimately you may serve mammon instead of God. But that's why I think the qualifications of a bishop are so important that it's not somebody that's money-minded. It's somebody that's willing to hold fast the faithful word and not be greedy or filthy lucre because it's somebody that needs to take a stand and you say, you know what, even if you guys stop giving to the church and even if churches stop supporting me, which I personally don't at the moment, I'm still willing to preach the truth and I'm still willing to take a stand for the word of God. And you know what, if I have to go back to work, then, then so be it. I'm just going to trust that God will provide for me and my family. And I think that's what the mindset that every bishop and um, deacon that is supported by the people of God need, need to take that stand. So, you know, there, it's possible, um, and it's possible to be financially dependent on people, but doctrinally independent. But, you know, there are some dangers, because obviously finances can, can be used to threaten um, authority or threaten a bishop to, um, to change their stance or to, to make a decision contrary to what they believe is right. Um, 
you know, there's a, there's a temptation to compromise because obviously if you know, you know, your, your, fa your family and your, your life is being supported by the people that you may not want to say people, uh, you may not want to say things that upset people. And, you know, maybe as a word of wisdom to other bishops out there, it might be a good idea to not live so luxurious a life so that if you do lose your funds that you can still sustain yourself and not have uh, and be willing to, to live just a basic life. Um, what are some other dangers? Uh, yeah, the other danger is just that there is a temptation, obviously, to serve uh, mammon instead of God. And the Bible says that you can't do that. You're either serving mammon or you're serving God. But it is possible to serve God, like I said, and still receive a paycheck. Two last things I just want to cover before we uh, break. But um, what, are, what are some advantages and disadvantages? So... There, those are some dangers, those are some disadvantages. But what are the advantages of being supported? Obviously, if you're supported, then you don't have to worry about where the money comes from, right? You don't have to worry about getting a job. So obviously, you've got the money coming in. That, that, that's the obvious advantage. But also resources, because if you're supported by people, you know, people might let you use their building, or people might have you know, other things that they can give you, like a lot of churches that start are given old chairs from other, from other people. So money and resources. But... I think on top of that as well is if you're supported, there's no need to work a second job. So right now I do work a full-time job and, and to be honest, that takes away a lot of my time. It talks, takes away 40 hours a week. Imagine if I had that 40 hours a week to, to minister to you guys, to study the Word of God, to organize things. I mean, that would really free some things up. You know, we're a small church right now and we don't really do anything that big. You know, we have the soul winning and we have the social event every now and then. But even with that and just preaching one t once a week, you know, I, I, I struggle to comprehend how some people can work a full-time job and preach three times a week. And it was funny, I won't name him, but I was talking to one bishop and uh, you know, I, I, he was saying to me, like, oh, you know, how are you finding it? And I was saying, oh, it's, it's good that we just have the one gathering because you know, I spend so much time preparing my sermon. I, I couldn't imagine preparing three every week. That would just be insane. I just have absolutely no time at all. And, and he was joking with me because he was saying like, yeah, you know what, because he has three, three, three gatherings a week. And he was joking with me and saying, yeah, you know what, and sometimes on Sunday he's just winging it because like he hasn't had the time to prepare. And you know, I don't really want to be in that situation. I mean, I'm struggling enough as it is already to prepare one. But when you guys come together on Sundays, I want to give you something really meaty to chew on so that you have some of these things to think about. So, you know, there's no need to work that second job. Um, and you can, focus you can focus more on the work in the ministry. And this is why you know, I'm not really for those people that are saying, oh, you know, a bishop cannot take a paycheck. He must work a full-time job because it's obvious to anybody that if I didn't have to work a full-time job, obviously I could concentrate more on this because right now all that's happening is I'm working two jobs. You know, I'm working this job, which is not paying me, and I'm working a job at work, which is paying me. So I'm strapped between two, and anybody knows that when you're working two jobs, you don't do both as effectively as you could as if you worked one job. That's why in your contract, when you sign at work, they, they, there's usually a clause about not moonlighting and not having like, you know, a second business on the side because they're paying you this amount so that they have your full attention so that you're not doing things for your other job um, at work. So it's obvious that you know, there, there are advantages of uh, being supported because you can focus solely on that work. But the last thing I want to cover is just this. So why did I choose not to be supported? Um, or why am I currently not supported? I mean, number one, you know, we don't really have the funds to support you know, the, the, the bills that I have to pay. Um, but why did I choose to start this church not supported and not go around and get support? Uh, well, a couple of reasons is, is you know, you know, traveling around and getting support, I personally believe it's a poor use of time. Um, it's a poor use of your time because there's a lot of time invested in traveling and going around to these different churches that may not even end up supporting you, may not even have the funds to support you. But not only is it, I think it's a poor use of my time because it takes a lot of time to go travel to all these churches, especially people that go overseas and travel and visit all these churches and try and get support. It takes a lot of time and you know some people I, I met this one guy that was that was coming around australia and he had been on deputation for years trying to get to the northern territory and he didn't even know whether he had somebody to sponsor him yet 
So for years and years and years, he's spending this time trying to get support. But not only that, think about all the finances that are going, because he's not working a job. So all the finances that are going into that are people supporting him. And where is all that money going? Into airfares, accommodation, eating out, you know, because, you know, they're traveling all the time. So they're eating out at restaurants and things like that. And you say, well, maybe those churches are taking care of all that. Well, money is still money. You know, those churches are using money that could otherwise be used for somebody else uh, on missionaries that are traveling around trying to get this support. So I thought it was a poor use of my time. I thought it was a poor use of money because I didn't want to spend all this money, you know, even if it's my own money, going and traveling to churches and not knowing if they would even support me uh, and, 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 and provide the, the amount of income that would be necessary to have an income. But the other thing as well is, you know, would churches have even supported me knowing my positions? You know, once they found out what I, what I believed and what I, I knew, would they even support me? I mean, you know, I'm already getting ostracized by a lot of different churches. Uh, not that I care, but, um, you know, this is one reason why I didn't bother trying to go and get support. Because would they even support me, number one? And number two, how long would they have continued to support me once they found out about our church? Um, so... There are things like that. Um, but also, you know, because I, because I knew that when I started this church, I was going to be different. Um, and it's not that, it's not that the, the bishop that ordained me didn't know I was different, because a lot of people were thinking like, oh, you know, well, you're just sort of being a phony until like you, you were sent out. No, because the, 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 the man that ordained me knew everything I believed. We had already discussed things that were going to be different. We had even discussed the name of the church because that was a big bombshell for some people. It's like, okay, we didn't name it a Baptist church. But it's like, you know, we'd already discussed that and, you know, he, he didn't have a problem with that. So, he, you know, he, he, he ordained me knowing that I was going to be different, but other churches didn't know I was going to be different. So I just figured, you know what, I knew I was going to be different. So I wanted to work this church in a way where I could uh, work a full-time job as well because I didn't want the temptation to compromise uh, what I believed was right just because churches were going to pull their support or they were going to decide whether to support me or not. You know, our church is small enough for me to contribute to the giving as well. So, you know, because our church is still small, I want to be part of that giving rather than drawing on, on those finances. And then our church has more finances to help people that really need it. You know, because maybe our church will get to the point where we need some full-time workers. But until that point, all that money that's going into paying a salary can be used to support things that we agree with or to support people that, that need the money. And then we have the money there to do what a church should be doing, which is charity work. Um, so I didn't want that added worry of knowing where my family was going to get the money. I wanted to, be, uh, I wanted to contribute uh, to the funds. I didn't want that added you know, that added concern of where the money was going to come from. So I just decided to work a job as well. But also, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to try this as well is I wanted to be an example to the other people and the people in our church that you can be a dedicated, hardworking employee that is excelling at work and, you know, moving up at work and still be a devout Christian a devout soul winner because how often do people say oh you know I'm married now I don't have time for this or I have children now and I don't have time for this you know you know so they have children and they say oh it's hard to go soul winning and I just want to show people that you know there is a way to have children where you can work it out with your wife and you still go soul winning um, and to take my example from it but also the fact that you can have a job and you can be successful and provide for your family and still have the time for church still have the time to get together with one another and still have the time and make the time to go soul winning and knock the doors. You know, yeah, do we not get to enjoy all the pleasures that other people do? But that's part of the example I want to set is, you know, those things, those pleasures that people enjoy and spend some of their time on, I'm not saying that they're wrong, but they're, they're secondary. You know, I'll forego a holiday. I'll forego, you know, the, 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 the boat trip or whatever and things that people do. Hey, it's great if you can do all those things. I think they're fun. But you know what, I think it's more important that we are doing what God has us to do here, and that's to preach the gospel to every creature. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to be supported. And you know, one day I hope that you know, our, our church can support me, because I think that would be great, because that would free me up 
to do a lot of the projects and a lot of the things that I could, could do. You know, I could do things like, you know, go sit in on the council meetings. I could find out what's happening in the community. I can find out and I can update you. And um, to me, it, it's kind of like any charity or any, you know, activist group, you know, the activists of that group, they're supported by that group, aren't they? So a church is no different. You know, a church is the same. We're, we're an activist group. And we're trying to, to put forth, you know, our ideas and our, tr and our um, stances into the community. But if all of us are too busy with work and jobs, I mean, there's nobody there that's really committed to that full time. And that's really what the bishops and deacons should be doing. So I'm not against it at all. Um, I think there are advantages and disadvantages. I just wanted to share with you a couple of reasonings behind why I chose not to be supported. But I do hope one day that our church grows to the size and has the funds where I could be. And we would have deacons and we would have multiple ones. Because you know what that means? When we get to that point, it means we're reaching more people. And it means that we're influencing um, this neighborhood and we're influencing you know, even other churches. Because I hope that this church gets to the point where we're a force to be reckoned with. Not just so I can say, oh, look at all the people in my church, because it means that we're making a difference. And it means that we'll have, you know, the people, you know, because if more people are coming to this church, that means there are more chances that a qualified man will come to this church and then we can ordain him, we can send them out and we can start other churches and we can really make a difference in this country.